Since its inception, Kingdom Hearts has touched the hearts of so many who have immersed themselves in not only its intuitive and engaging gameplay, but its complex storylines as well, as traveling through the many Disney worlds sees you interacting with the many heroes and princesses that have become so popular over the years. Adding to this is the ever-wonderful RPG element that comes from the Final Fantasy aesthetic, thanks to the then Squaresoft. Even fighting against or even alongside the Final Fantasy characters makes the series, at least in my opinion, a cut above the rest when compared to other RPGs of the time. But something I find that is often overlooked within the games, and especially with the first game, is the history and folktales of the many worlds that we get to explore. Worlds like Agrabah, Atlantica, and so many others. And in this video, I want to take the time to talk about this, and there's no better place to start than with the first world of our journey, and the opening of Kingdom Hearts 1, Destiny Islands. Serving as the tutorial world for the game, Destiny Islands is host to our three main characters, Sora, Kairi, and Riku, alongside familiar Final Fantasy characters, Titus and Waka from Final Fantasy X, and Selfie from Final Fantasy VIII. Something that I like about this start to the game is that the opening cinematic leads directly into the opening moments of Kingdom Hearts. Though the opening cinematic may be cryptic at times, it strikes our curiosity and interest as the game doesn't actually have you immediately start on Destiny Islands, but instead lets us dive into the lore and folklore of the game within the dive into the heart. After the initial portion of Sora's dream and the opening cinematic, he lands on a platform that depicts a stained glass portrait of Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And for any of those who were wanting to see the amazing opening cinematic and hear its music. And that's about all I can play before it gets copyrighted. Continuing on, we begin our journey into the dive into the heart, a stage that has us choosing the style of gameplay we want throughout our playthrough. By choosing to focus on either attack, defense, or magic, your stats and even some of the skills you learn as you level will be focused on that specific aspect, all while turning down any of the others will help cement how you progress through the leveling. These specific choices have some good benefits, like learning scan earlier, but also have some drawbacks, with moves like counterattack being learned at higher levels. I've left a link in the description to the Destiny Islands site and KH guides so you can see for yourself the full details of what each choice does. Moreover, the act of choice is something that is continued throughout our experience, throughout the dive into the heart, and even into Destiny Islands proper. This is something that I'll be touching on in just a moment, but I'd like to first talk about the elephant in the room, the floor that we stand on to be precise. See, throughout the tutorial, Sora will run across and battle on top of these stained glass murals of iconic Disney characters, consisting of Snow White, Cinderella, Aurora, and even Belle, who stand alongside some of the side characters who are associated with each of them. Sadly, we won't get to meet any of the princesses until way later into the game and even into some other entries. But from each of their stories, they hold our first look into the mythology and folklore that Kingdom Hearts firmly stands upon. Starting with Snow White, her story as well as Cinderella's were forged by the brothers Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, 19th century novelists who collected a series of folklore and fairy tales from their homeland of Germany as well as the surrounding countries of France, Switzerland, and Italy just to name a few. In the original tale of Snow White, she is a young princess who is seen as the fairest of any in her country, not only in beauty, but in personality as well. When her father, the king, remarries after her mother's death, he marries a prideful and evil woman who practices witchcraft and almost every day asks her spellbound mirror 
to announce to her who is the fairest of them all. To which the mirror consistently replies that Snow White is such. In anger, the evil queen orders Snow White to be killed, but thankfully she is taken pity on and is set free into the forest where she meets seven dwarves who again take pity on her and allow her to stay with them as their housemaid. Years later, the evil queen finds that Snow White was never really killed and seeks to finish the job herself. Disguising herself as a haggard old woman, the evil queen finds the cottage and an older, much fairer Snow White. In finding her, she attempts to poison the girl three times and is only successful after the third by convincing her to bite the poisonous apple that she had already bitten. This puts Snow White into a death-like coma and is put into a glass coffin that is built by the dwarves to honor her death and her fairness. Soon after, a young prince finds her and is so smitten by her beauty that he takes her coffin back home to her kingdom. However, on the way there, the coffin is jostled by servants and Snow White revives suddenly when the poisoned apple bit falls from her throat. The two lovebirds soon wed after this, and when the evil queen learns of their marriage, she reveals herself once more to kill Snow White. However, she is grabbed by the prince's men and is forced to dance with scalding hot iron shoes until she eventually dies. It's believed that this story first played out in Ovid's Metamorphosis, in the story of Shioni, the daughter of Daedalion. In this story, Shioni is the most beautiful of any maiden in Greece, so much so that both Apollo, the god of music and light, as well as Hermes, the god of roads and language, sought to have her in the most lustful of ways. In having their way with her, she bore two sons from them, Autolycus and Philemon. Autolycus became a charlatan, and Philemon became a famous singer, according to the myths. The connections to this story stem from the fact that Apollo took on the guise of an old haggard woman to meet Shione for the first time, and that Shione was believed to be the fairest of them all. The last connection, and the most interesting in my opinion, comes from the fact that the goddess of the hunt, Artemis, grew so angry with Shioni's boasting of her beauty that Artemis shot her in the tongue and throat with her arrows, killing the girl instantly. As we progress further, the next platform that we stand on after attaining our weapon through the tutorial depicts Cinderella with a very different hair color. This change was made in the Final Mix version of Kingdom Hearts 1, and it actually fits with the original story, as within the story, she is depicted with having more reddish-brown hair instead of the typical blonde hair that Disney has painted her with. For her story, it's actually one that many cultures around the world share, as countries like Iran has a story called the Moon Forehead. In Korea, they have a story called Kongji and Pashui. And even the Maltese has a Cinderella story named Seklemfusa. All of these different stories and the story of Cinderella is one of rags to riches in a quite literal sense. In a version of the story written by the brothers Grimm, Cinderella is a good and kind Christian girl who is forced to wear literal rags by her stepmother and stepsisters so they can have Cinderella's father's wealth all for themselves. When Cinderella is gifted with a twig, she plants it in her mother's grave and cries over it every night, watering it with her tears. As years pass, a magical glowing tree grows from this twig, and Cinderella soon learns that a festival is being held by the king to help a prince choose a wife. The family learns of this, and the step-family goes to the festival, leaving Cinderella 
behind to tend to the house. However, Cinderella soon retreats to her magical glowing tree and prays beneath it, praying to be dressed in a beautiful gown and slippers. Once she does, she suddenly is adorned with exactly what she wants, as heavenly white doves don the dress and slippers on her. And at the festival, she is able to dance with the prince the whole night. However, when night falls, she hides away and returns home, leaving her stepfamily none the wiser. The next two nights occur just like the first, but in her haste, Cinderella loses her golden slipper. Seeing the slipper, the prince proclaims that he will marry the maiden whose foot fits the slipper. And as the prince had helped Cinderella get home after the festival all three nights, he returns to her home, knowing it must belong to one of the girls there. Once at the house, he asks the daughters to try on the slipper, wanting desperately to find its wearer. The first stepdaughter tries it on, and as it fits, the prince realizes that her foot is bloody, as she had cut off her toes. The second stepsister does the same, but her heel has been cut off. Finally, he asks for the third girl in rags to try on the slipper. As she takes the slipper, her foot slides perfectly into the slipper without any issue. And with that, the prince whisks her away and makes her his bride. As common as this story is around the world, and with so many variations and interpretations, it's really no wonder how this story is as popular as it is. Taking a good and faithful girl from her lowest point and allowing her to become a queen by permitting her to be herself helps any who feel that they are in the same place to be in Cinderella's shoes. Or slippers, really. But this story actually has an ancient origin that dates back to around the 6th century BCE. Recorded by the Greek historian Strabo in the 1st century CE, he wrote that a young and beautiful hetera, Rhodopis, was bathing in the city of Nocrates in Egypt when an eagle swooped down and plucked her sandal from her grasp. The eagle flew to the capital of Memphis and dropped the sandal in the lap of the king during a trial. As eagles were seen as personifications of the gods, not only for Egypt but for Greece as well, the king took this as a divine sign to find the wearer of this slipper. He quickly ordered his men to travel throughout Egypt in search of the maiden that was missing a slipper. They soon came upon Rhodopis, who swiftly rode to Memphis. Once there, she was reunited with her missing slipper and was made Queen of Egypt. Now, what's worth noting is that this story was actually written about by Herodotus in his book The Histories some 500 years prior to this telling, though it's still up for debate whether this was actually the same story or a different one. Furthering our journey through the dive into the heart, we enter through a mysterious door, and we find ourselves back at Destiny Islands. However, our three friends, Waka, Titus, and Selfie, asks us peculiar questions. With Selfie asking us what's most important to us, Waka asks what we want out of life, and Titus asking us what we're afraid of. All of these questions may sound like they are coming out of nowhere, but they actually have some deeper meanings that not only originate from the ancient beliefs, but as well through the gameplay of Kingdom Hearts. Now, depending on what answers you give to each of the three, you'll get one of three outcomes in how our adventure starts. The dawn, the midday, and the dead of night. These three outcomes decide on how our leveling will progress as we play through the story, with dawn meaning our leveling will slow after hitting level 50, midday meaning that our leveling will remain consistent throughout, and the dead of night 
meaning that our leveling will get faster after hitting level 50. Now, it's this act of choice that we had mentioned earlier on that affects our outcome for our journey, as choice is a tool that is often used to allow the player to have their own personal playstyle, making every playthrough unique in a sense. However, this does come with some caveats on the matter of choice. In our first choice of which weapon we want, we are forced to pick one of the three, and are forced to throw away another. No matter which option you choose, one must be taken, and one must be thrown away. We're never given a choice on just not taking a weapon, or not throwing one away. The same can be said for the introspection of the three friends asking us questions, as you have to speak to all three to progress. It's impossible to walk past them, or even jump over the small ledge to venture around Destiny Islands. So this begs the question, is this really choice? In a way, yes, we can choose how we want to progress in levels and stats, but in the end, we are forced to pick the options that are given to us. There is no moving forward without picking what the game essentially wants us to pick. This concept of choice ties into the thought behind the entirety of Destiny Islands, as the island itself not only holds our destiny, but the destiny of others as well, as we'll later see in this game and even others down the line. In myth, destiny is tied to everyone and everything in the universe. Between the many cultures of the world, nearly all of them have their own take on destiny or, in other terms, their own take on fate. When looking into the ancient world, the Greeks probably have the most prominent figures that weave the destiny of everything in existence. The Fates, a trio of women who weave the string and tapestry of everyone's life to decide on how their life begins and ends. To the Greeks, they're called the Morai and they are not a force to be trifled with, as even the gods of Olympus will rarely ever speak of them or go against their ruling. For the trio, it's Clotho who will spin the thread of a person's life, forming and shaping it into the thread of who they will be. Then there's Lachesis, who is the one to measure out the thread, deciding on how long a person will live and how their life will be lived. Then finally, there's Atropos, and it's with her that the thread of a person's life is cut, deciding the when and how a person will die in their time. As we look to the north, the northern people of Europe believed in beings known as the Norns, who again are a trio of women, specifically giants, who decided on the fates and destinies of mortals and the gods. As they are named Urd, Ferdandi, and Skuld, it's believed that these three tended to the world tree Yggdrasil by residing by the sacred well that lived around the roots, giving the tree the nourishment it needed with the divine water that they possessed. To the east, the Vedic people of India believed in a concept known as Ruta, spelled R-T-A, which stood for the natural order of the motions that life took in its course. Within the Vedas, the people and everything around them were tied to the fate that was ordained from the beginning. Two terms that took prominence over time were Dharma and karma, derived from and even eclipsing the original Ruta. These were the concepts that were becoming more commonplace in the evolution of the Vedic belief, with Dharma referring to the motions that cohesively intertwined with the natural order of life. A person is born, they live their life, and then they die. 
if this order was subverted in any way, then the Dharma would be lost to the person. As for karma, it refers to the act and effect within a person's life. If a person acts with good intent, then their life will see a good effect. Sadly, this portion of the Vedic belief has lost some ties to the order of fate and the Ruta, and many who have followed the Vedic belief have actually pushed for the return of this belief of Ruta. Furthering this are the three forms that are associated with the Ruta, one being named Gati, being the continual movement of life, the second being Samgatna, being the whole of life, being connected to everything else, and thirdly is Niyati, being the order in which all life moves. It's with these three that the Ruta can continue and form the fate of a person's life as well as the fate of the universe. Progressing further through the dive into the heart, we come across the Aurora and Bell platforms, with one to teach us about the save points and the other about light and darkness. Unfortunately, I won't be covering these two Disney princesses here, as we'll be discussing their stories and origins later on when we get to Hollow Bastion. But at the Bell platform, we learn of one of the most important themes throughout the entire game, and one that will lead us to our first boss fight. As Sora steps further into the light, his shadow becomes stronger. So strong, in fact, that it becomes a dark side heartless. This concept of light and dark is one that has been seen through the ages and throughout multiple cultures. With light and dark not only being opposing forces, but as well two sides of the same coin. On the topic of opposing forces, the book of Genesis, specifically chapter 1, verse 4, states, And God saw the light, and decided that it was good. Then God divided the light from the darkness. This verse emphasizes the thought that the light was good, while the darkness was bad, which isn't actually far off from the theme of the entire series, as the realm of darkness corrupts any who reside there, while the realm of light purifies any who exist in it. As for the aspect of light and darkness being the two sides of the same coin, we can look towards Greek mythology once again as within the realm of the dead and with the summit of Mount Olympus. Seeing that both the underworld and Olympus do play a part in the Kingdom Hearts series, it's fitting to see that these two play a role within the overall theme of the game as well. With the underworld, it's seen as a chthonic domain of darkness, as many of the myths in the ancient Greek world discuss the entrance into the underworld and even the inside of it, framing it as a cave-like domain. In terms of theme, Mount Olympus stands opposite to the underworld, as a realm of celestial light that sits high above the clouds. Here, many of the gods live atop it and observe the world below, highlighting the fact that the god's light provides the good in the world. This duality of light and dark is seen again in Norse mythology, with the light and dark elves as well as the dark realm of Niflheim, or Helheim, and the realm of Asgard. Finally, we can also look to Eastern philosophy on the concept with yin and yang, expressing this concept of light and dark being both opposites that combat each other, but as well as being intertwined with one another, sharing once again the thought of the two being one in the same. Now, when we look at our first boss encounter with Darkseid, let's explore the design and the reasoning behind this boss that exists as Sora's shadow. Darkseid is one of the most recognizable Heartless within the entire series, and is featured in nearly 
every game. In its design, it has unblinking yellow eyes, a heart-shaped hole in its torso, and a small pair of skeletal-like wings on its back. This design for this enemy always reminded me of Dorman from Shadow of the Colossus, which, funny enough, is another game that discusses the concepts of light and dark. I actually have a video explaining that, and I'll tag it just in case you're interested. But as we look closely at Darkseid, we find that this Heartless relates back to the concept of the fall from heaven motif. This motif is seen primarily within the Abrahamic belief that the devil, or Lucifer, was once an angel working alongside God, and rebelled against him. In his sacrilege, he fell from the graces of heaven, and his wings burned down to their skeleton. Being left unusable and as a constant reminder of his rebellion. Furthering this motif is actually the Canaanite mythology, who saw the morning star, Atar, attempt to overthrow God in heaven, and being unable to accomplish this, was cast down into the underworld, to be stationed there as its ruler for all eternity. Now, when relating back to Darkseid, we can see that they are one of the higher forms of the Heartless within the realm of darkness. It's not fully expressed here in Kingdom Hearts 1, but is seen more so in further titles. Now, finally, after defeating Darkseid and exploring the dive into the heart, we come to thanks to Kairi, and finally get to run around Destiny Islands. Here on the island, there is quite a lot to explore in our opening of the game. From climbing to swimming, we finally get to officially meet the group of friends that are core to the plot of not only Kingdom Hearts 1, but the entire series. Sora, Kairi, and Riku. Three friends who want to see what's out there beyond their small bit of paradise, and learn of the worlds beyond their own. Now, what's noteworthy, and what leads into our next point, is the fact that we also get to talk with and even fight our three friends on the island, Titus, Waka, and Selfie. Now, when we had initially met them, they were merely representations of our inner desires and fears. However, this time, we see their full personality and the triad that they form. And it's with this concept of the trinity or triad that we find our next mythical point. For the concept of the Trinity, it's seen in multiple religions and cults of worship around the world, from the Hindu Trimurti to the Morai of the Greek myth that we had mentioned before. What the Trinity truly represents is a trio of perfection that each can cycle back onto one another, as well as connect each other to form one central being or concept. To put this into perspective, the Christian belief of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all represent different but equal parts of the Godhead, while maintaining the thought that the three were one, but also separate. It's not the easiest to explain fully, but understand that in the ancient world, it was believed that the number three was perfect. And in this perfection, it was seen in multiple parts of worship around the world. In Egypt, the Abydos Triad consisted of Osiris, the father, Isis, the mother, and Horus, the son. In Greece, they saw multiple triads, with the most famous being the Big Three of Olympus, consisting of Zeus, the heavens, Poseidon, the waters of the earth, and Hades of the underworld. As well, even in Norse myth, when Loki's children are captured, they are three. Fenrir the wolf, Jormungandr the snake, and Hel the half-dead, half-alive girl. Now, as we look back at Destiny Islands, we can find trinities in a lot of different places. There's one with the initial three, Sora, Kairi, and Riku. Another with the Final Fantasy trio, 
Titus, Waka, and Selfie, and even the island itself, as there are three distinct sections to the island. The primary beach, the cove, and the secret place, with each one holding its own significance to the story and our experience in our adventure, while forming the whole level of the first world in the game. Also, I would count the area in the small shed, but most times players won't really explore this or even know that it's there. But as we progress through the world, we learn to fight and gather materials. Then on the second day, we get to enter the cove. While here, Riku will challenge us to a race to run to the star tree and back. And whoever wins gets to share the Palpu with Kairi. Huh? Well, sort of. But in reality, we actually just get to name the raft and subsequently the gummy ship later on down the line. Riku will suggest the High Wind be the name of the raft, while Sora will suggest it be named Excalibur. Now, if you're any familiar with the Final Fantasy series, you should instantly recognize these two terms as they are used in practically every game in the series, not only for the name of a ship, but as well some characters and even some weapons. Though the term High Wind doesn't really have any ties to mythology, as it primarily refers to strong winds that move the ocean, its counterpart Excalibur holds a lot more water to it. Originating from the Arthurian legend among the British Isles, Excalibur was the magical sword of the King of the Brightons, Arthur Pendragon. In the now famous tale of the sword in the stone, it tells that on one Christmas Eve, a sword was wedged deep within a stone block, and the magician Merlin formed a contest to see who could pull it free, as pulling the sword out would reveal the true king of the land, and the heir of Uther Pendragon. Many tried, but could not succeed until a young squire under the knight K was asked to fetch a new sword for him to battle in his contest. Seeing the free sword standing within the stone all by its lonesome, the squire swiftly and easily pulled the sword free and gave it to his knight. After this, Arthur, the young squire, placed the sword back into its stone pedestal to make any unaware of its usage. However, it was Merlin who learned of the sword's freedom thanks to his magic and gathered the townsfolk to witness the sword being pulled free. Asking the young Arthur to pull it, the young squire pulls the sword out without any issue, leaving all in awe. And with this sword, Arthur was to be named king and heir to the Isles. Told through many movies, games, and shows, the original story was initially told through prose in French, Welsh, and even English poems during the 1100s. Now, I should say though, it has been debated whether the sword and the stone was actually Excalibur, as some poems of the time, namely the post-Vulgate cycle of the 13th century, claim instead that the sword and the stone is the Irish sword Caliburn, or that it just wasn't named outright. Furthering this, during King Arthur's first few years as ruler, he actually breaks his divine sword in battle against the King Pelinore, and is instructed by Merlin to toss the sword into the lake. Soon after, either the same sword or a different one, depending on which version you read, is lifted from the waters by the Lady of the Lake and is given to the Knight Bedivere to be given to King Arthur. It's believed that this sword given by the Lady of the Lake is the mythical sword Excalibur, unyielding and unbreaking. As we come back to the island, and after completing the race, collecting our supplies, and finishing the raft, the gang is ready to set sail for new worlds. However, Sora's nightmares are becoming reality, as the Heartless swarm the island as a fierce storm rages. These shadows can hide themselves in the ground and are currently impossible to hit or kill. But 
thankfully, we can actually just run past them for the time being, as we'll be exploring them and their mythology when we get to our next world. But the nightmare continues as we see Riku swallowed by darkness, Kairi fade from existence, and our island become nothing more than rubble. It's here that we end our time with one world and explore the next. I want to say thank you all so much for watching. Next time we're going to be covering Traverse Town, and I hope you're just as excited as I am. If you enjoy this type of content, then consider supporting the channel. I've left some links in the description so you can check them out there. Thank you all so much again, and I'll see you all next time.